Hi everyone. So welcome to the live stream today. Always a privilege coming your way as we continue with our discussion towards the August 2022 examination. And we are continuing with our practice question in the IFRS masterclass. Now note that uh, we've been on this journey for a number of uh, weeks now having some sessions relating to the key standards that we have to focus on to increase the chances of passing the examination. On Wednesday, we solved questions relating to the IAS 16 and how revaluation is supposed to be uh, done. And a couple of questions came along with assuming if there is a revaluation, then there is a deferred tax implication on the revaluation. How do we deal with that as well? It means that you are now bringing in IAS 12, that is income tax. So today we want to continue with our discussion in re regard to that and answer uh, or attempt two more questions relating to IAS 16 and bring in IAS 12 income taxes to see exactly what we can do in, when it comes to dealing with these standards. Now remember that if you are writing financial reporting or corporate reporting, the standards are going to be crucial because they are the basic issues you need in order for you to increase your chances of passing the examination and i see some of you guys joining us on facebook as well as on youtube remember to give us a thumbs up on the video share the video let us reach as many students as possible most importantly let me hear from you in the comment section what questions do you have for me relating to the ifrs's relating to the standards relating to the uh financial reporting relating to the corporate reporting remember we are in the eighth weeks eighth week what it means is that we are left with five more weeks to go for the august 2022 examination and the exam is starting on the first of august and ending on the fifth of august i'm really excited because this season we're going to be just looking at questions assisting you with key areas in order for you to prepare well for the examination and most importantly pass the exam. So leave it in the comment section, whatever questions you have for me, put it in the comments box uh, for me or in the chat box. So those of you joining us on YouTube, I will be answering all your all of your questions and most importantly, providing you with some assistance that you need in order for you to prepare well and pass the examination. We are seeing some thumbs up coming in from um, Bobo Sante, Fred Rotimi, Nicolas Suawini, Eric Ahiadeki. Thank you guys very much on Facebook with a thumbs up on the video and you guys also on YouTube for the thumbs up on the video. So we're looking at two key questions today and these questions are relating to IAS 16 with the IAS 12 situation coming in income taxes and we're going to see how we actually deal with these particular issues and let, like I said put in a comment section for me any questions you have and we will get excited about it remember that you can download the insurer premium mobile application on the google play store or the app store and get access to some exclusive contents lecture videos uh nodes and also be able to enroll in our full course if you want to study directly under my mentorship and get access to everything so i can assist you better to prepare well for the examination so let's get excited about the day's discussion and then let's look at a couple of questions real quick i see some chats coming in uh let's see if i can uh answer some of them elisha said hi i'm elisha watching live from garu okay where is garu i don't know garu let me know elisha maliak said hi Inshira. good evening to you hello Ma malia thanks for joining us cc jones said hi Inshira. you have superb teaching skills that is why i'm very confident with registering in the eighth week great mentorship program always a pleasure i hope that we can assist you to be able to prepare well for the examination and pass the exams good evening sir uh good evening uh israel I hope you're doing well, Israel. Uh, Erica here, the case said, good evening, boss. Thanks for your good works. Always a pleasure. And thanks, Eric, for joining us on the live stream today. Any questions, put it in the chat for me. I want to hear from you guys. I want to answer any questions that you may be having as we prepare ourselves to continue with our 
discussion. Remember also that you can get access to our financial reporting book and then the corporate reporting uh, book as well. These are no books introduced. If you're a follower of my work, you know that I mean simplicity and uh, strategy is something that is critical to me. So these books are structured in a manner covering everything that you need to understand so that you can really prepare well for the examination. You can get copies of those books by reaching us on WhatsApp and uh, delivery will be done for you nationwide. So let's get excited about uh, the day's discussion and we want to look at a few questions uh, today and uh, set the discussion ongoing in that regard so let's see the first question we want to look at is uh still about revaluation of assets but we're going to take it a step further a little bit to uh bring in issues about taxes if you remember the question we looked at on wednesday it was revaluation of assets however uh they did the company did not make annual transfer and so i illustrated to you how the workings would have been assuming the company uh, had made an annual transfer and you saw the consequences or the uh, treatment for that when a company makes an annual transfer. But the second aspect that we mentioned that revaluation of assets has is the issue relating to taxes. And that is what we want to jump into today and then uh, discuss some few key issues about when there is taxes and how we deal with that. Now, before I jump into the question, let me just give you a crash course again, just a quick review on the issue relating to IAS 12 income tax. Now, at this level, income tax is uh, crucial. It's one of the fundamental standards you need to know about if you're doing financial reporting, especially because, like I said, it's one of the fundamental standards. And definitely there is something in the exam hall about IAS 12 that you must know about when it comes to preparation of the single entity financial statement, whether you are preparing statements of comprehensive income, whether you are uh, dealing with issues relating to statement of changes in equity, whether you are dealing with statement of financial position or whether you are dealing with a statement of cash flows. Whatever it is, there is going to be IX, IS 12 bit that is going to be coming up and you must be mindful of that. So let me give you a crash course on IAS 12 generally, and then we're going to take some few questions here where we're going to be merging IAS 16 with IAS 12, and then you're going to see how the entire picture adds up together to help us to really understand these standards. I see some questions coming in. Let's see if I can uh, take them quickly as we jump into IAS uh, 12 here. Timothy A has said, uh, please, if revaluation is done at the end of the year, when does the transfer start? The transfer will start in the subsequent year because if revaluation is done at the end of the year, depreciation would have been charged for the year already using either the current amounts brought forward or the cost of the assets. So any transfer will be done from the subsequent year, not in that year that they did the revaluation for the uh, of the asset. Okay, not in that year they did revaluation for the assets. Kinsley said, good evening, sir. Watching you from Zambia. All right, Kinsley, thanks for joining us on the live stream today. Nicholas said, please, is there any revision and what amount, if any? No, I don't do intervention classes. Our executive revision masterclass is exclusive to our students. Uh, I don't do intervention class. I don't do any revision class. Our executive revision masterclass is exclusive to our students. And uh, that is how our program is designed. We have our main class coming in. Then we've already started with our uh, revision class, uh, Saturday, Sundays, solving questions in key topics, in key subjects. Then our main executive revision master class is going to be starting from the 8th, 18th of July uh, to, I think, 31st of July. And that is also a two weeks intensive session for us to wrap up and then um finish and get a student prepared to go in there and pass the examination so we don't do intervention classes we don't do any revision classes our executive revision master class is exclusive to our students because that is the time we get to spend with the students um solve their problems solve critical questions with them and then provide them with the blueprints and assistance that they need in order for them to position themselves better in the examination. So Nicholas, unfortunately, there's no 
revision session. Uh, in that case, the only way you can be part of our program is if you enroll in our main course at 390 Ghana cities per paper. That way you join our main class, uh, weekly main class, and then you join our weekend practice question sessions, and then you'll be able to also join our executive revision master class as well and study directly under my mentorship. So no revision class, unfortunately, uh, we don't do that, Nicholas. Clark said, good day, sir, joining from Liberia. That's awesome. Thanks for joining us on the live stream today. Um, Timothy, let me know if the question you asked and the answer I, pro answer I provided uh, was good for you. Let me know. Or was okay for you. Bernard Penstill said, good evening, sir. May God bless you for your mentorship program. I have now developed some confidence in FR and PSAF that I'm going to sit this August. That's awesome to hear, Bernard. Uh, Pencil, wishing you all the best as you continue to study and work hard towards the uh, August 2022 examination. Wishing you all the best, definitely. If you have any questions, I see some of you guys jumping over. Give us a thumbs up on the video. It really helps us a lot to push the video so we can reach many students and together assist many others just like you and so give us a thumbs up on the video and also share let's get as many students as possible watching the live stream um kasi kas kasaila ferry forgive me if i don't mention your name right okay uh even in uh, joining from zambia all right thanks for joining us from zambia as well let me bring back my screen and let's get excited about it so i'm going to give you a crash course on ias 12 income tax and i want you to really really stay with me carefully as we go through this crash course about ias 12. now you see the idea about transactions and events is that transactions or events is that uh, when an entity undertakes a transaction, whatever transaction that the entity undertakes, there are tax consequences of the transaction. So for instance, whether the entity acquires shares, okay, so acquisition of shares, that is making an investment. That investment may be accounted for in accordance with IFRS 9, if they don't, they, they, are, they are not getting any control at the end of the day, that is financial instrument, or that investment could be accounted for in accordance with IAS 28, if they have significant influence in that particular case, or that investment could be accounted for in accordance with IFRS 3 business combination. So an entity acquires shares or makes an investment into another company, and then they can account for that investment in accordance with IFRS 9 as a financial asset, or if they have significant influence, they may account for it in accordance with IAS 28, investment in associates, or if they control the entity, then they may account for that transaction in accordance with IFRS 3, business combination. Not only that, the entity may acquire assets, okay, tangible non-current assets. If an entity acquires tangible non-current assets, it may uh, decide to account for that asset in accordance with IAS 16. That is, if the company is using the asset for its day-to-day -day running, and that is property, plants, and equipment, or the entity may want to acquire uh, account for the asset in accordance with IAS 40, investment property. All right. So either the entity is acquiring shares, there are options of treatment of the shares as per the financial reporting standards and the requirements for the uh, general purpose, um, uh, the conceptual framework. If the entity inquires uh, tangible non current assets, there is a way it has to be accounted for at the end of the day. But you see, for all these things that we are talking about, there is a tax consequences of them at the end of the day. For instance, the investment we make, if we liquidate it, it may result into tax consequence in the future. For instance, the assets that we have bought, if later on we dispose of the assets, there may be tax consequences about it. The investment property we are using, if we get rid of it, there may be tax consequences. So IAS 12 is about uh, providing or making provision or making 
taking treatment for the future task consequences of transactions that have taken place in the year under review. I hope you are getting the idea. So as you are and the, uh, acquiring shares and you're applying IFRS 9, IAS 28, IFRS 3, as you're acquiring tangible non-current assets and you are uh, doing IAS 16 or IAS 40, there are also tax consequences relating to this item and it is important for us to account for them. But the question we ask ourselves is, why will there be uh, you know, tax consequences for these transactions and why should we be mindful of this transaction and these events? It is simple. The reason is that the way the transaction is going to be accounted for by the entity is going to be different from the way that transaction will be accounted for by the tax authority. That is a rationale generally, because whilst the entity is thinking, thinking about the current amount of the transaction, all right, the tax authority doesn't think about current amounts necessarily. The tax authority is asking, what is the tax base of the element? What is the tax base of the transaction? What is the tax base of the investment? So for instance, if you are dealing with tangible non-current assets, definitely as per IAS 16 or IAS uh, 40, the entity may be depreciating the assets. And so they may decide what kind of depreciation method that they want to use, whether they are using straight line method or the reducing balance mm -hmm. method to depreciate the assets. But a tax authority doesn't know depreciation. Instead, what a tax authority knows is what we call capital allowance. All right? It's what we call capital allowance. Not only that, the entity may decide to revalue its assets so that it reflects the fair value as per IAS 16 or IAS 40 or whatever applicable standard that the entity is using in that particular case. But when they revalue their assets, the tax authority doesn't know about revaluation of assets. So tax authority doesn't do any revaluation. So there is no issue relating to the tax authority when it comes to revaluation of assets. When you revalue your assets, the tax authority has not seen it. They don't do revaluation of assets in their books, so they don't see it. So you realize that there is going to be a difference between the way the entity accounts for the transaction as per the financial reporting standards and the way the tax authority accounts for the transaction as per the laws. So the difference between the current amount of the asset and then the tax base of the asset, note that the tax base of an item is simply the amount attributable to the item for tax purposes. So when we say the tax base of item, an item, it is simply the amount attributable to the item for tax purposes. All right. It refers to the amount attributable to an asset. Oh, sorry, to an item for tax purposes. Sounds good for tax purposes. So there is always going to be a difference between the current amount of the asset or the transaction and then the tax base of the transaction. So the difference between the current amount and the tax base is what we refer to as the temporary difference. And that is going to be the difference between the current amount of the transaction minus the tax base of the transaction. That is going to be the temporary difference. But you see, this temporary difference can be, can have two implications. Okay? This temporary difference can have two implications. We can have what we call taxable temporary difference and deductible temporary difference. So taxable temporary difference and deductible temporary difference. Now, the distinction is very simple. There is taxable temporary difference if the carrying value of the asset is greater than the tax base. Okay? It means the way the entity is carrying the item in their book 
is greater than the way the tax authority sees that item. So if you receive any future economic benefits relating to that particular item or that particular asset, it means you get a capital gain. And if you get a capital gain, that capital gain will be subject to what? Tax. So anytime our carrying amount is greater than the tax base of the asset, we refer to it as taxable temporary difference. And that is what results into what we call deferred tax liability. That is what results into what we call deferred tax liability. And the deferred tax liability is simply going to be your temporary difference times the tax base. Sorry, times the tax rate. So tax rates multiplied by the temporary difference, and that gives you the deferred tax. The opposite of that illustration is true. If it happens that your uh, carrying amount is less than the tax base, it means the tax authority is carrying the item at a, an amount higher than the way you are carrying it in your books. It means if you dispose of that item, that asset right now, you're going to be making losses. If you make a loss, then the tax authority would have to give you a tax credit. So that tax credit is what we refer to as deductible temporary difference. And that deductible temporary difference results into what we call deferred tax asset. Does that make sense? It's what results into deferred tax asset. And again, that is the same thing as the tax rate multiplied by the temporary difference that you had. Okay. Now, note that this uh, deferred tax liability by def uh, th this deferred tax situation, by default, must be adjusted for in the PL account. However, there are times when it will have to go in the OCI or must be split into both the PL and OCI, especially when the deferred tax is arising from revaluation of assets. So where the deferred tax is arising from revaluation of assets, it is likely that that deferred tax component will have to be recognized or treated in the other comprehensive income. So basically, and we're going to get into that in a moment. So basically, when we talk about IAS 12, when we talk about income taxes, that's basically what we're talking about. That's basically what we're talking about. However, we need to get excited a little bit about the entire discussion and make it a little bit bigger because uh, there is going to be the tax accounts that you would have to prepare when you are doing your PL accounts. And then there is also going to be uh, a tax account that you're going to prepare if you are doing the statement of cash flow. If you are doing the statement of cash flow, but we're going to be getting into all of those things pretty later on as we continue with our discussion. Any questions for me quickly? Any questions for me? And then let's make sense with some numbers and uh, see what we can look out for here. I see some chats coming in. Greetings from South Sudan. Ring a call. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Timothy said, yes, I have the same idea from last year, but I solved some questions and they did transfer same year at that Reiko question. I don't know where you're getting Reiko question from. If revaluation is done at the end of the year and depreciation for the year was not calculated using the revalued amount, annual transfer cannot be done. So make sure you read the question well and... Uh, understand the requirements of the question. But if they did a revaluation at the end of the year, which is what you are saying, then certainly depreciation for that year cannot be calculated using the revalued amount. Then certainly there cannot be annual transfer. So if that is what is provided in the solution, then the solution is wrong. So either the solution is wrong or maybe you are missing an information in the question. So read a question very well to understand what is going on. I don't know what you meant by a RECO question. Elijah said, good evening. Is it only FR or you also take PSA in addition? I don't get a context of your question, but I teach uh, uh, public sector as well. 
Um, Matthew Abu Churi said, watching you live from Navrongo. Thank you, Machi, for joining us. Uh, Ring said, um, kindly help me understand the difference between IFRSs and IAS. I think we've sm spoken about that some time ago. We said that I, I, IFRSs and IASs are the same. IFRSs are the new standards that are being issued to sort of bring the accounting standards in line with that of the USA standards. So IFRS and IASs are the same. IASs are, you know, the ones that have been there all this while from the beginning of time since they started introducing these standards. So uh, we have I, we had IAS 8, that was inventory. Uh, sorry, IAS 18, sorry. That is revenue. Now, that standard has now been replaced by with IFRS 15, revenue from contracts with customers. We have IAS 10, or we had IAS 10. That is also construction contracts. That has also been replaced by IFRS 15, revenue from contract with customers. So they are the same. The IASs was the previous standards that are being issued, and the IFRSs are usually the new standards that are coming in to provide uh, to serve as a replacement to an obsolete standard or to provide a new standard on matters that were not in existence before. And in an attempt to bring the IASs in line with the U.S. Uh, accounting standards to help international adoption and comparison of financial statements. So if you ask the distinction between the two, they are the same thing. There is no difference. So now that we have some understanding about this whole deferred tax situation, let's crunch some numbers and let's make sense out of it. So let's see what we have here. Now, like I say always, it is important that you read the requirements of the question and most importantly, know what you are expected to do in a given scenario for you to be able to understand what exactly is going on. So let's see the requirements that we have here. The requirement we have here is pretty simple. It says, explain how the revaluation, including any deferred tax impact, should be dealt with in the financial statement for the year ended 31st December 2015. 31st December 2015. So let's see how we can go through this. Clark bought an asset for 500000 on 1st January 2013. On 31st December 2015, the property had a carrying value of 470000 and was revalued to 800000 So be careful here. Revaluation is occurring at the end of the year. Okay? So revaluation is occurring at the end of the year. Now, if revaluation is occurring at the end of the year, then the question we need to ask ourselves real quick is, hey, um, what do we have to do? Now, you realize that we have been given the carrying amount at the end of the year, which is 31st December. So it means they have already calculated depreciation. There is no need for us to figure out anything about depreciation again. We just have to jump in straight and then go into the discussion. So let's see what we have. We're going to bring in our currency sign. Then we bring in the carrying amount here. So carrying amount will be brought here. And that is going to be at 31st December. 2015, and that is given to us as $470,000. Then we look for the revalued amount on that date. We're going to bring this up a little bit. So revalued amount. It's happening on the same date, 31st December 2015. And that is going to be an amount of $800,000. So if you look at it, you realize that the revalued amount exceeds the carrying amount. So the balancing figure is going to be revaluation surplus, which will go to the other comprehensive income. Okay? Revaluation surplus, which goes into the other comprehensive income. So if you do the maths, 800 minus 470, and that is $330,000. And that will go to the other comprehensive income, the OCI. That's not all we have in the question. That is not all at all. So let's continue with the question. It says that, let me clean up this requirement part. It says, the tax written down value at 31st December was 420000 
So that is the tax base of the asset as a 30, uh, 31st of December, and that is 420,000. So we're going to be bringing in the tax base. On that same day, 31st December 2015, and that is an amount of 420,000. So if you look at it, you realize that the revalued amount is more than the tax base of the asset. So the difference between that is going to be what we refer to as taxable temporary difference. Taxable temporary difference. Why? Because your revalued amount is greater than your tax base. Does that make sense? So... 42800 let's see what we have that is 380000 so that's our temporary difference now remember like i tell you always presentation is critical when you are doing some of these work so once we have the temporary uh, taxable temporary difference what did we say we said taxable temporary difference result into a deferred tax liability so let's see we bring in the deferred tax liability at the tax rate given to us in the question. Sorry. Okay, that's above here, 20%. So the tax rate here is at 20%. So we take 20% of 380. And that gives us an amount of $76,000. But this is where you have to be careful. This is where you have to be careful. This 76000 deferred tax cannot be taken to the PL accounts directly. Why? Because this deferred tax is coming partly due to the revaluation of the asset. Okay? Partly due to the revaluation of the asset. So we have to share this 76000 deferred tax liability and determine how much you go to the PL and how much you go to the other comprehensive income. So the question we ask ourselves is, how much of this 76,000 will go to the PNL? How much of this 76,000 that will go to the OCI? Now, the amounts that will go to the OCI will be equivalent to the revaluation surplus. So defer tax to, defer tax liability to the other comprehensive income will be the 330,000, which is the revaluation surplus, Multiply by the tax rate, which is 20%. And that is going to give us in that particular case. So 330 times 20%, that is 66,000. So that is how much goes into the OCI. And then the balancing figure of that is the deferred tax liability that will go to the profit or loss account, which is the balancing figure of 10,000. This is the workings we do relating to this particular question in that case. Now, remember, this is not what the examiner said you should do. Now, let me know if uh, you understand the workings very well. I'm seeing a question coming up there saying, sorry, please, how do we get the tax base to be 420000 The question has given that to you as the tax written down value at 31st December is 420,000. That is directly given to you in the question. So you pick it up and you work with it. You pick it up and you work with it. Then uh, I'm seeing another comment coming up. Good evening, sir. Is the fair value applicable to all non current assets, IAS 16, IFRS 16, and IAS 40? When you say fair value, applicable what exactly do you mean give me some context in your question and then can provide you with some answers there so these are the workings we do but the examiner said explain how the revaluation including the any deferred tax impact should be dealt with in the financial statement so we could extract the financial statement and then bring up our scenario the name of our company here is clark so we can bring in the statement of profit or loss and oci so statement of profit or loss and oci and other comprehensive income oh 
for the year ended 31st December 2015. Remember, this is going to be an extract. Okay. Because it's not a full year financial statement. It's going to be an extract in that particular case. So let's extract the financial statement. So in the profit or loss, what do we bring? Remember, depreciation for 2015 had already been calculated. Okay. Depreciation for the 2015 had already been calculated so what is going to be happening here is that we are going to be bringing in the deferred tax or the income tax that is going to pnl which is the ten thousand. so what we will have here is income tax from our workings that's going to be ten thousand. so we bring it up ten thousand. That's going to be coming up. Then we go to the other comprehensive income. And the other comprehensive income, we are going to be bringing in the revaluation surplus, which we had from our work. If you remember, our revaluation surplus was three. 30,000. So we bring that in. 330,000. But the deferred tax component must be brought. The deferred tax that is going into the OCI is 66,000. So we bring it up here. 66,000. It's a liability as well. Could put this income tax in bracket. Now, so this is how our statements of profit or loss and OCI um, is going to be determined or found in the question in that particular case. Then we go to the statement of financial position. Again, that is going to be an extract. So statement of financial position that's going to be an extract usually. And as an extract, we will bring in the Now the current amount of the asset will become the revalued amount. So under the non-current assets, we'll bring in the property, which is the revalued amount, which was given to us as 800,000 because that has now become the current amount in that particular case then we go to the issue relating to equity and under equity we're going to be bringing in the revaluation surplus and that is going to be the 330 we had which is the revaluation surplus minus the deferred tax of 66,000 and that gives us the figure for the revaluation surplus. So 330 minus 66, that's going to be 264,000. There. Then under liability, we're going to have non current liability. And that is going to be the deferred tax. So non-current liability, we're going to bring in the deferred tax. Let me cut this and put it in the next slide or on the next slide instead. Let's see, paste it. So what do we have? Non-current liability. That will go to statement of financial position. And that will be the deferred tax. And from our work into the entire... 76,000 comes here. Does it make sense? So this is how the statement of financial position is going to look like. This is how the statement of financial position is going to be like. Is it always the case that the tax base will be given? It depends on the context of the question. If you remember what we said here, we said when you're dealing with tax base, 
the tax authority is interested in capital allowance. So that is what the tax base is interested in, capital allowance. So you may be required to uh, look at the capital allowance given to you, and then you will calculate the tax base yourself. It depends on the question. The same way you will calculate for depreciation for the entity using either a straight line method or reducing balance method. The same way capital allowance, the question could give you the information and you have to calculate the capital allowance and calculate the tax base as at the reporting date and then determine whether it is deductible temporary difference or taxable temporary difference. So it depends on the context of the question. It happens that in this one, it is given to you. So you use it like that as it is given. I was thinking the temporary difference should be the difference between the carrying amount and the tax base. Why were you thinking that way? If the asset has been revalued, the asset has been revalued. So it, if it has been revalued, you cannot go and carry it, compare your tax base with the carrying amount. Because as you can see on the face of the statement of financial position, the asset is now carried at its revalued amount. So since it is carried at its revalued amount, that becomes the value that we will compare with a tax base to determine the temporary difference for the entity. How are you going to account for those two figures in the, okay. Yeah, I think we've already done that. So that is the idea and what we need to do relating to this particular question. So like I said, it just happened that you are giving the tax base in this question. So you don't have to think about it and uh, uh, look at it in that particular case. And uh, that is direct in that particular regard. So that is the issue about that. Let me know if there are any other questions about this. And the main thing that we want to bring to your knowledge here is the relationship that is happening between IAS 16, how you are dealing with revaluation surplus, and then the tax implication, how it is also being dealt with. Remember, you can get this as a five mark question in the exam hall, or it could be a footnote as part of the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, or as part of the footnotes when you are dealing with your cash flow statement in that particular case. So be careful and make sure you know about that very well so let's look at another question again that has that sort of relationship and let's see what we can do here again it's a five mark question here let's see what we have here explain how to account for the above transaction in the financial statement of abudu limited for the year ended 30th of september 2017 so it's very important. We are dealing with Abudu Limited, and our year ended is 30th September 2017. Now, it is always, always important for us to uh, bring in and know about the issue relating to the uh, year ended so we can know exactly what is happening here. Now, this question, it's a little bit, you know, going to bring in the IS 12 bit match. So stay with me carefully. On 1st October 2016, now remember, if the year end on 30th November, 30th September 2017, then it means it started on 1st November, sorry, 1st October 2016. Because from 30th September, you go to 1st October. So the year starts on 1st October 2016 and ends on 30th September 2017. So let's see the information that the examiner is going to be giving to us. Abudu Limited decided to revalue its land for the first time. Keyword for the first time. The land was originally purchased six years ago for $65,000 and was revalued to its current market value of 80,000 on 1st October 2016. So it is very important to understand exactly what is going on in relation to this question so that you can understand what is coming in. 
We are told that the land was originally purchased six years ago for $65,000. Remember, land is not a depreciable asset. So don't get any ideas about, oh, we are going to depreciate. Land is not a depreciable asset. So don't have any idea about depreciation, carrying amount. No, 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 no. Don't bring yourself here. Just go ahead and do what you have to do. So land is not a depreciable asset. Okay. Ideally, you know, we expect land value to increase. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't fall in value. A land can suffer an impairment due to various things, natural disaster, you know, um, a government policy and all of those things. But note that in the context of this question, don't get any ideas about depreciation because it is a land. So if it is a land, the question we ask ourselves is, what exactly is going on here? So if it is a land, here we're dealing with Ghana City. So we're going to be bringing in the initial cost of the land, which is the 1st October 2016. And that is the $65,000. So we bring that up very sweet, simple, straight to the point. Then it has been revalued. So we bring in the revalued amount. So the revalued amount here is $80,000 on the same date. 1st October 2016, $80,000. So that means that the land has increased in value, isn't it? So the balancing figure becomes a revaluation surplus. And that is $15,000. So there's a revaluation surplus here at $15,000. Now, as there is a revaluation surplus, you know where that goes. Other comprehensive income and revaluation surplus, certainly. Then we continue to read the question. Now, again, if you pay attention, realize that I work I read a question, I work. I don't finish reading the entire question before I start working. And that is a trick you must understand always. And I keep on telling you this all the time. When you are giving the question, you don't read the entire question before you start. Oh, what am I supposed to do? What am I expected to do? No, you go in there, dig deep and start working as you read. Then we continue. It says that the difference between Abudu's net assets, including the revaluation of the land, and the lower tax base of the September 27 at September 2017 was 27,000. Okay. So the question you need to ask yourself is what is the meaning of that? Look at the language. Look at the language and, and, and listen to the language, read the language very well. It says the difference keyword between the net asset of the company and the lower tax base was 27,000. What does that mean? It means when you compare the net asset of Abudu with the carrying, sorry, with the tax base of the assets, the net asset of the company is greater than the tax base of the assets by 27,000. Ghana cities. Does that make sense? So it means this is taxable temporary difference. It means this is taxable temporary difference. So I will push it and bring it in. So here you are not giving tax base. You, you, are you seeing the structure of the questions? You are, you are not giving tax base in this question. Instead, the examiner is taking you straight and giving you the taxable temporary difference. And if you are not able to distinguish between that, that, oh, this is a taxable temporary difference, then that is the end of you, technically. Let me know if that is okay for everyone. So taxable temporary difference here is 27,000 Ghana cities. So once we have a taxable temporary difference, it results into a deferred 
tax liability. So the fair tax liability at the end of the year, our tax rate is the opening deferred tax liability at 1st October was 2600 and Abudu's tax rate is 25%. So we do at 25% here. So 27,000 at 25%. And that is 6,750 Ghana cities. 6,750 Ghana cities. But remember, this is the year-end deferred tax because we have opening deferred tax. So this is like balance brought down year-end, but then we need to bring in the balance brought forward deferred tax that is at the beginning of the year, which in the question is given as 2,600. So when you strike it out, the difference becomes the movement in the fair tax. Because when there is opening and closing, our interest will be movement in the fair tax. And the movement in the fair tax is going to be 4160. Sorry, 50. 4150. But be careful here. That movement in the fair tax cannot go entirely into the PL account. We must split it into the PL and OCI. Why? Because of the revaluation. All right. So again, this movement of 4,150, assuming it did not come as a result of revaluation, we would have taken that directly to the PL account and added it to income tax in the PL account as an expenses. But because this movement is coming as a result of revaluation of assets, then a portion of that must go to PL, then a portion will go to the OCI. So how much goes to the OCI? So deferred tax to the other comprehensive income, it's going to be 25% of the revaluation surplus, which is the 15,000. Okay, because the amounts that goes to OCI is always the tax rate multiplied by the revaluation surplus. And that gives us an amount of 3750. So the balancing figure is the deferred tax that goes to the profit or loss accounts. And that's going to be 400. Any questions, please? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? So that is the idea here. That is the idea here about this question. So you realize that when you pick this question, in the first one, we were given tax base. So we needed to calculate temporary difference. Here, you are given the temporary difference. So all you know you do is to calculate your tax, but then there was opening tax figure or opening deferred tax, so you'll be interested in the movement. And that movement is what you have to share between the OCI and the PNL. You see how beautiful the question is? So it depends. Now you could pick a third question, and this time around you'll be giving the, um, how do we call it? You could pick a third question, and this time around, you'll be given maybe the way you have to calculate the tax base, and then you work yourself up. So let's extract the financial statement uh, quickly. So statement of profit or loss and OCI. You can put that in full. Slash in our currency sign in the profit or loss first. Now, remember, there was no depreciation situation coming in here, so we go straight up. And then we're going to calculate the issue relating to, um, oh, sorry, we'll bring in the issue relating to income tax. And from the workings, you realize that we are bringing in 400 there. It's a deferred tax liability. So we put it in the bracket for the period under review. Then we go to other comprehensive income. And we bring in the revaluation surplus. 
All right. Which is the 15,000. Then we'll bring in the deferred tax. Which is the 3750. Okay, 3750. That's the deferred tax. So that is the statement of profit or loss. That's the statement of profit or loss and OCI. Then in the statement of financial position, you know already what's supposed to be there. Remember, these are all extracts and a non-current asset. You're going to bring in property, land is property. And you bring in the revalued amount of $80,000. Sorry, <laughs> we are in Ghana cities, I guess, in this particular question. I'm mixing the currencies up here. So 80,000. Then under equity, we're going to bring in the revaluation surplus. And that's going to be the 15,000 minus 3750, the amount that was going into the OCI. All right? So 15,000 minus 3750, that's going to give us 11. 250 11250 then we bring in non current liability now in the non current liability we're going to have deferred tax and that is going to be the closing figure we calculated that is what goes to the PNL the closing figure which is the 6750 that is what goes to the PNL. This is the answer to the question. This is the answer to the question. So that is the issue relating to that. Any questions? Let's see what we have here. Why, if there was a revaluation loss, how will it be? treated revaluation loss will be treated in the pnl in that way any deferred tax will also be treated directly in the pnl because this is the first time in the question they said this is the first time they are doing the revaluation so if it is the first time they are doing the revaluation and it was a loss we would have recognized it in the pnl accounts and any deferred tax implication of that will also totally be recognized in the pnl account oci wouldn't have come into the picture because it's a first time revaluation there. Then, say please, what happens to deferred tax if revaluation of assets does not take place? I don't understand your question about what happens to deferred tax if revaluation doesn't take place. I don't understand your question, so maybe provide me with some more context in your question, okay, then I can understand. Because if we say what happens to deferred tax if Revaluation of asset does not take place. I don't understand what you're saying there. Maybe you give me some context, then I can provide you with some answers. So that is the idea, basically, about how we deal with the issue relating to deferred tax. Okay, now look at the difference between the first question and then this question. Like I said, there is another question where you would have to calculate the tax base yourself, determine the temporary difference yourself, calculate the deferred tax yourself, deal with the movement yourself. Sometimes the examiner can take you back. So it depends on the structure of the question and what you are supposed to do. And it is always crucial for you to understand exactly what is going on for you to be able to really really answer the question but for abudu limited this is what we do remember like i say always presentation is key presentation is key so the way you present your work is going to be crucial remember this is workings this is not the answer to the question now after that you can prepare the financial statements and let the examiner know exactly 
what you are doing. And because it's an extra financial statement, we don't balance anything off. You just leave the figures the way they are, uh, just distinguishing between what is an income and what is an expenses by negating or leaving it as an absolute figure. Then you'll be okay in that case. Then you'll be okay in that case. So that is what you need to understand basically when it comes to the relationship that exists between IAS 12, income tax, and IAS 16, property plans and equipment. Let me know if there are any other questions you have for me. Uh, in that case, that is the issue there. So like I said, you would don't understand a standard or you don't say, oh, I understand a standard until the standards are interconnected. Now you can get one question in which you are going to be dealing with IAS 16, you are going to deal with IAS 12, and you're going to be dealing with maybe impairment also at the same time, IAS 36, impairment of assets. So it is crucial on your behalf that you'll be able to understand how all these treatments actually go on in that case. And that is the idea about that. And that is the relationship on subsequent measurement. Remember, IAS 12 comes in under subsequent measurement. If you remember on Wednesday, we saw the, one of the questions where subsequent measurement, that is IAS 36. So on subsequent measurement, IAS 36 is going to come to town. That is impairment. Then on subsequent measurement also, IAS 12 will come to town. And that is going to deal with the income tax. And that is where, when we revalue the assets. So you have to know at what point which standards comes in. Then when you read a question, the treatment should click, right? It should click just of the record as you read. You should know exactly, oh, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. It's supposed to go to OCI. I'm supposed to split it. I'm supposed to take it to p and I'm supposed to do this adjustment. And as you do that, solve a lot of questions, that is how you can understand more how all these standards actually come to life. So that is the issue about that. Let me know if there are any other questions for me uh, relating to these uh, particular issues in that particular case. And uh, let's see. Kofi, Selas, Amina, Ama, Richardson, uh, Kogoleba. Uh, thanks for the thumbs up on Facebook. Really helps us a lot. And for those of you also giving us a thumbs up on YouTube, thank you very much for that. It also helps us. Um, if revaluation of asset does not occur, will part of the deferred tax still be treated in the OCI? It depends on the item you are dealing with in question. It depends on the item that you are dealing with in question. If the item you are dealing with has an OCI implication, then any tax relating to that must also be recognized in the OCI. It is all about matching concepts. So the reason why deferred tax is coming into OCI is because the revaluation surplus is coming into OCI. So it depends on the context of the transaction because there are uh, other issues that may bring about uh, deferred taxes and they will be recognized in the OCI and they are not going to arise because of revaluation of assets. They may arise because of other uh, issues that we are dealing with, like um, how do we call it? IFRS 9, financial instrument. If you are dealing with financial assets carried through uh, uh, OCI, which is an alternative way of accounting for financial assets, and there is a tax implication of that, certainly the deferred tax on that financial asset carried through OCI must be recognized in the OCI. So it is not only revaluation of assets that brings deferred tax into OCI. Financial instruments, as per IFRS 9, as per IAS 32, presentation of financial instruments, will be also treated in the OCI if and only if the transaction in question has an OCI implication. So that is the issue that you must understand uh, in that case. 
Kingsley said uh, very clear. Okay, that's fine there in that case. So that is what we wanted to bring to your knowledge today or to your notice today, these two questions on how, you know, you can merge up. If you are doing corporate rep uh, financial reporting, this is done deal. IAS 12 is waiting for you in the exam hall. IAS 16 is waiting for you in the exam hall. You cannot run away from them. Either there will be a dedicated question or the final account, there is part of it. Whether you are doing cash flow, there is income tax there you have to handle. There is IAS 16, PPE account you have to handle. If you are dealing with statement of profit or loss and OCI and the statement of financial position also, IAS 16 is going to be there. IAS 12 is going to be there. So for corporate reporting, these two standards, you better... So for financial reporting, these two standards, you don't have an excuse. It's a done deal. It's sure. It's there. It's going to be smiling at you. And you want to learn it well, know it, and get those sticks coming in there in that case. For corporate reporting, like I said, either you're going to be having a dedicated question on that uh, in the exam or, or as part of the consolidated financial statement or as part of business uh, reconstruction or financial reorganization, uh, you're going to be having uh, issues there relating to application of IAS uh, 16, property plants and equipment in that case. So that's the idea. That is the idea basically about that. And I'm going to be concluding around here today uh, relating to the discussion. Uh, on Monday, I'm going to be providing a crash course on cash flow statements because I think we've had a number of uh, concerns about it. So on Monday at 4.30 p.m., I'm going to be coming your way and we're going to have a crash course on cash flow statements and then hopefully maybe solve question also relating to the cash flow statements so that we know uh, that is one of the single entity financial statements. We have to be aware of in financial reporting, but corporate reporting students also, that will be a found foundation to you because yours is consolidated cash flow. That is, you know, we take it to a, 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 a level when we have a complex group structure and we are dealing with consolidated cash flow. So on Monday, we're going to be continuing with a discussion and we will have a crash course on cash flow statements. Go through all the principles, take a question and see how IS 16 is going to be applying in cash flow, IS 12 will apply in cash flow, IFRS 9 will be applying in cash flow, and how other standards have implication on the cash flow statements and how we go about them as well in the exam hall. So that's it about that. And uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, make sure you stay connected. You can follow us on Insta uh, Instagram as well. And uh, because details will also be posted there and you will get a uh, notification about it. But most importantly, subscribe to the YouTube channel and click the bell notification icon. That way, when we arrange a meeting, you will be able to uh, have discussion in that particular case. Um, okay, thank you. God bless you. God bless you too. Uh, Elijah said, clearly explained and understood. That's awesome. Uh, are we having a weekend class on Saturday and Sunday? I don't understand your question about that. Our weekend classes are for paid students. I don't know if you are a paid student. If you are a paid student, details about that should be available on your timetable. So uh, you can check on your timetable about that. So that's it. Enjoy your weekend. Remember, we have five weeks to go. Technically, I may say we have four to go in that case because four weeks from now, we'll just be doing final work and uh, flexing together and going into the exam hall. So that's it. Have a great weekend, and I'll catch you on Monday as we continue with our discussion. Bye-bye.